Good evening. I'd like to call order the Thousand Oaks City Council meeting for Tuesday, January 11th, 2011, and wish everybody a happy new year. If you'd all please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Ready to begin. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Madam Clerk, could you call the roll for tonight's meeting, please? Council Member Gillette is absent this evening. Council Member Bill De La Pena, present. Council Member Glancy, here. Mayor Pro Tem Irwin, present. Mayor Fox, here. Item four is request for continuance of public hearing or agenda items. I note that item 15A, a conference with labor negotiators, has been uh, pulled from the agenda. Um, and there are no other requests for continuance. Uh, does the council have any court requests? All right, hearing none, uh, we'll move to item five, that's special presentations. Um, before we move to special presentations, the entire nation, in fact, the world uh, witnessed uh, a terrible tragedy uh, over the last week. Uh, and, and I think it's important that as we begin tonight's city council meeting, uh, we acknowledge that 14 people um, were wounded and six people were killed uh, in the event that took place on January 8th in Tucson, Arizona. The victims of uh, this incident were taking part in their constitutional right to assemble and discuss issues important to our nation's future. And it is right at the heart of our democratic philosophy. Among the dead was a nine-year-old little girl. Her life was lost that day while she was attending the event. It is really quite unimaginable that uh, this type of damage and this type of uh, incident can occur here in our community and in, in an environment where uh, we are a free nation. Uh, and it's a reminder to all of us to one, count our blessings, uh, two, um, be thankful for the nation that we live in and our ability to meet uh, and discuss issues uh, in freedom. Uh, one of the tragedies that day, uh, in a special note, was um, a member of the uh, six that was lost her life, a Phyllis Schneck. Uh, Phyllis was a 79-year-old mother of Phyllis uh, Rottenberg, a Thousand Oaks resident and music teacher. Um, she is a teacher at the Alice Stell Middle School and a member of the Thousand Oaks Philharmonic Orchestra. Phyllis's mom was not particularly a political person, uh, but she did attend a rally that day to find out a little bit more about what was going on in that area. Um, and she had an interest in Representative Gabriel Gifford. Phyllis was known for a unique, kind, and outgoing personality, and she would be missed by her family. We'd like to take this opportunity to acknowledge uh, all the victim's family and know that uh, we are praying for their recovery, for those who are injured, and our deepest sympathies and condolences to those family who lost loved ones. We hope that the families involved will find comfort and strength in knowing that in America, everywhere, people are keeping their thoughts and prayers with them. So if you'd all join me for a moment of silence uh, to honor those that lost their lives on January 8th in Tucson, Arizona. Thank you very much. We have no special presentations this evening, and so we'll move to item number six, that's public comment. Madam Clerk, could you call a public comment, please? This is the time and place for public comments. A speaker card is available for those wishing to address the City Council regarding items on the agenda or on a subject within the City's jurisdiction. Pursuant to council standards of operation, the mayor may assist any speaker from straying into areas not within the city's jurisdiction. All remarks should be addressed to the council as a whole. Under state law, issues discussed under public comments can have no action unless listed on the agenda and may be referred to the city manager for administrative action or scheduled on a subsequent agenda. All documents for city council and the official city records should be presented to the city clerk prior to speaking, and speakers are requested to state their name and community of residence for the record. We have one person who has presented a card, and pursuant to council standards, speakers are allowed three minutes. The yellow light will display when you have one minute remaining. All right, we're starting out the new year with one public comment card. 
Wonderful. Uh, and that is from the Youth Commission, Jake Kolop and Hannah uh, Barrett. Good evening, Jake. Happy New Year. Uh, good evening. Uh, good evening, council members. My name is Jacob Kolhup, and I'm on the publicity subcommittee for the Youth Commission's 21st Annual Therapeutic Dance. My uh, co-speaker, Hannah Barrett, is the chair of this event. First of all, the therapeutic dance is a prom for students ages 13 and up with disabilities. It is held annually at the Teen Center and includes dinner, dancing, a souvenir photo, entertainment, movies, and more. The theme for this year's dance is Ultimate Heroes. We have provided invitations for you, and they are also available on the table on the way out if anyone wants one. Attendees can dress like their own personal hero, a firefighter, policeman, armed forces member, or a superhero. The cost is $5, and scholarships are available. Good evening. My name is Hannah Barrett, and I'm the chair of this event. The dance is scheduled for March 26th from 6 to 9.30 p.m. The Youth Commission would like to invite all council members and all members of the community with disabilities. Finally, we would like to thank our sponsors so far, Fresh Brothers, Western Bagel, Trader Joe's, Vons, and Sprouts, along with the Alex Fiore Teen Center for partnering with us. If you have any questions regarding this event or are interested in sponsoring, please contact the Youth Commission via email at youthcommission@toks.org or call 805-449-2743. To RSVP, please call 805-381-2739. Once again, we would like to thank City Council for their continued support of the Youth Commission and this event. All right, thanks very much to both of you, nice job. Also, uh, Mr. Mitnick, if you could ensure that the uh, dinner and dance for March 26th be put on the city's website, uh, just to give them some assistance with uh, notification, that would be great. Item seven is the city and redevelopment agency consent calendar. Do we have any requests specific on those items to call special? None? Can I get a motion? Mr. Glancy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I uh, move the consent calendar. And Mr. Clancy moves. Uh, any discussion? Vote, please. The motion carries 4 0 with Councilmember Gillette absent. And let me just read the ordinance title. For item G is an ordinance amending the code sections 4 4.306, 9 4. Point thirteen oh three nine dash four twenty three oh three nine dash four twenty three oh eight nine dash four twenty three ten nine dash four twenty four oh four and nine dash four twenty eight oh four regarding regulation of angle parking and setbacks landscaping and wayfinder signage within the C two AM zone MCA two thousand nine seven oh four three three. All right, thank you, Ms. Lawrence. Item eight, our public hearings. We have no public hearings uh, on the agenda for this evening. So we'll move to item nine, that's departmental reports. And uh, item 9A is a request to allow concurrent processing of entitlement for applications for zone change application. Uh, the applicant is Home Depot USA and the uh, location of this is the west side of Hampshire Road, north of Foothill Drive. Mr. Prescott, are you gonna be presenting the staff report? Good evening. Uh, good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. <clears throat> the uh, Home Depot company, uh, is interested in filing a new application for the old Kmart property on Hampshire Road. Uh, as the council will recall, their application was denied about two years ago. They have filed a zone change request from the existing C1 zone, uh, neighborhood shopping center, to the uh, proposed C3 zone, which is community shopping center. And they've also included the uh, old uh, Burger King site as part of their project area now. Um, the city code uh, provides that uh, no development entitlement application can be filed unless it's consistent with the existing zoning. And the council has previously determined that that Home Depot project was not consistent with the uh, C1 zone. Uh, however, since they have now filed a zone change to C3, the code does allow the council to grant uh, at the council's discretion the ability of an applicant to file 
uh, a development entitlement application to be processed concurrently with the zone change, and that is what uh, Home Depot is requesting tonight. They would like to have their new uh, project application, which is different in several respects from the one the council saw two years ago, and have that um, processed and decided at the same time as the zone change. Uh, if the council grants concurrent processing, the uh, staff would uh, uh, allow them to file their entitlement, their development permit application. Uh, we would do the environmental review, which would be a new environmental impact report, uh, schedule it for planning commission hearing, and uh, the commission's role would be to make a recommendation to council, so the whole package would uh, automatically come to council uh, at the end with the commission's uh, recommendation. Uh, the new site plan, uh, the basic change they've made is to uh, uh, provide a smaller uh, Home Depot building itself. It still has the garden center of about the same size as before. And the uh, building itself is reduced from 97,000 to 86,000 square feet. Uh, but there is a new um, uh, inline retail building of smaller shops of 10,000 square feet on the site. And also they are uh, because they've incorporated the old Burger King property, are uh, planning to uh, establish that, uh, remove the buildings, uh, but establish that as a location for a day labor site, which uh, they're attempting to address another concern the council had with the original project. So anyway, it's um, our recommendation that the city council uh, do allow the concurrent processing of the entitlements along with the zone change. We think that will uh, allow all of the issues to be before both the planning commission and uh, later the city council for uh, a decision on this new project. Thank you, Mr. Prescott. Questions for Mr. Prescott? All right, oh, Ms. Bill de la Pena. Yeah, Mr. Prescott, I was just curious, since the city initially wanted to study the uh, an amendment, uh, where are we with that, and why is this coming before us before we have even considered the amendment of the current um, municipal ch uh, code? Uh, yes, the city uh, council did initiate um, municipal code amendment to basically um, established definitions in the zoning ordinance for home improvement centers um, and I think building supply uh, stores and then also to establish in which zoning districts uh, such uses would be allowed and with which type of permit. Uh, as the council will recall, the staff had originally uh, interpreted the uh, Home Depot as a hardware store, which is an allowable use in the C1. Uh, the council, uh, following the review and public hearing, and decision did not accept that. And so um, we recommended and the council agreed to study a code amendment to define home improvement centers as differentiated from hardware stores, et cetera, and decide which zoning districts those would be allowed in. The staff is working on that uh, ordinance and it will be presented to the planning commission. Our tentative date is uh, in February. I think we mentioned it in the report. Um, February 14th, and then we project it would come to council on your March 22nd agenda, I believe. So, you know, we're just at the beginning of the, the Home Depot application, so long before I think even we have an EIR out on that project, the council will have decided that that matter. Um, the, other, the other part of it, I think, is that by requesting the zone change to C3, the city has a a real pattern and practice of allowing home improvement stores in the C3 zone. The existing Home Depot uh, on Teller Road is in the C3 zone. The old Home Depot on Ben 2 Park Road, uh, that site's C3 zone. And the Lowe's project, which is uh, going to be coming before the council at your next meeting uh, with a recommendation from the Planning Commission, is also in the C3 zone. So I think that, you know, even if that code amendment for some reason we're not passed, uh, if the zoning were changed, which would ultimately be the decision of the city council, it would, there really wouldn't be a question that it complied with the C3 zone. Thank you. Any other questions for staff? All right, we have one speaker card, uh, Tom Cohen, for the applicant. Mr. Cohen, good evening, happy new year. 
Good evening to you, Mayor Fox and Council Members. My name is Tom Cohen, a resident of Thousand Oaks, and Happy New Year to all of you. I'm here tonight on behalf of Home Depot and our request uh, for concurrent processing to uh, move this project along. I want to thank staff for uh, the recommendation in support of this request. We spent the last two years uh, since we were last in these chambers uh, carefully studying and examining uh, the redevelopment plans for this site. And I, I want to tell you, uh, we've paid particular care and attention to the direction and the concerns that were raised here that evening by this council. And you will see uh, significant changes to the redevelopment plan. Uh, and, and you'll see uh, in the not too distant future how those plans are shaping up. We've spent numerous hours now with city staff in what we call the pre-application phase, just kind of going through the issues understanding them and, and then uh, the plan is to put that into uh, the form of a plan. There will be extensive uh, environmental analysis again. It'll be a new, a brand new EIR as we see it. And of course, this will go through the planning uh, process and public hearing process. Uh, we believe that concurrent processing makes sense. This way you have an opportunity to view the project in its entirety. It won't be a bifurcated process. You'll have the, the environmental document will review the zoning and the project. If we were to not allow for concurrent processing, it would be in two stages. And I think it's for the benefit of the public as well as for you as the reviewers of this to evaluate this in, in, at one time. Uh, so uh, with that, uh, I am here to respond to any questions that you might have. Uh, otherwise, uh, we look forward to working with staff, coming back with a project I'm sure you'll be proud of. Thank you. Questions for Mr. Cohen? Ms. Bill de la Pena. Good evening, Mr. Cohen. Good evening. I was just wondering, in looking at the previous application and then this one, uh, there seems to be, regarding the square footage, a small difference. Uh, there are details about the day laborer site, for example, that is also proposed. Uh, what makes you uh, believe that your new proposal is significantly different from what you proposed two years ago? Well, we're, we're here tonight to talk about the concurrent processing request. I'm not sure I'm at liberty to really talk about the details of what our proposal is. However, the project as it was presented to the council was a Home Depot. Uh, this time we've come back with a Home Depot that is smaller. Uh, we have a, an outlying retail building that will provide for the, uh, the neighborhood uses that, were, that was called out. And day labor was a, uh, a very particular concern of this council that we felt needed to be addressed by dealing with, with it on site. So uh, that's far different than the proposal that was before you uh, back in March of 2009. And then regarding the concurrent processing, which I believe is always a good idea, if, for example, or hypothetically speaking, you came back uh, with all of the documentation and all that, and, uh, and council, of course, has to render a decision, do you feel that uh, you are, do you feel you are taking a risk in revisiting this at all, in spending all of the resources to do this? Of course. This is, this is uh, the development uh, world is always in a, a risk. Um, we leave this judgment to you as the council in your good judgment whether or not this is a viable and valued project for the community and we think that it is and we will present it that way and, and hope that you agree with us. Thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Cohen? Thanks very much Mr. Cohen. I don't believe Mr. Prescott any follow up after that. It's the pleasure of the council. Dr. Clancy. Oh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. What we're looking at here is just a procedural thing. It would be my uh, pleasure to move staff recommendation to grant the request by Home Depot to allow entitlement applications for Home Improvement Center retail building and day labor site to be processed concurrently with pending zone change app number 20107542. Mr. Glancy moves item 9A discussion on the motion. Ms. Irwin. I'm going to support the motion and I want to make absolutely sure that the public understands that we are not approving anything except for concurrent processing this evening. We will look at the project as a whole before we approve or disapprove it. Thank you. Ms. Bill any more discussion? 
I believe, as I mentioned just a couple of minutes ago, I do believe that concurrent processing is a good idea. I'm not sure whether in this case, where it seems the proposal, of course, is similar to the old proposal, whether it, it makes sense. I, I'm wondering whether all of the resources are, although not, shouldn't be my concern, but I, I'm wondering whether we, all of the resources will have been for naught if in the end the project will not be accepted. And uh, seeing that a C3 is vastly different from a C1, especially in that narrow, small, at somewhat denser area, I, I am concerned about uh, going down the road that would, could eventually lead to a, a zone change. I don't think that a C3 is appropriate for a C1. In, 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 in is appropriate to replace the C1 currently in that area. And although the council is not making any approval at this time, it, um, I think, I can think of only very few projects which were not approved after um, a municipal code change was initiated. So uh, it is rare, it's, it's rare that a municipal code initiation uh, or change initiation is um, in the end not fully granted. Um, um, so I, I, I do have concerns about that. And given that the study has not been presented to the Planning Commission or to the Council, I feel very uncomfortable approving this tonight. Okay. Uh, the, uh, I think the issue before the Council is one, do we think concurrent processing makes sense? Uh, I think that's unanimity amongst the council. It absolutely makes sense, not just for the council, but for the community, so that, as Mr. Cohen pointed out, they can look at the application as a whole. That just makes good sense, and it's worked very, very well in the past. Uh, secondly, while it's not in front of us tonight, I think the issue goes to were the items that were raised by the council and the concerns raised by the council, have they been addressed and have they been appropriately dealt with with the council um, that would uh, provide for a different outcome. I think it's fairly straightforward. So I'm certainly going to um, uh, support uh, Mr. Clancy's motion tonight. It is procedural. Any further comments? All right. Hearing none, vote please. The motion carries 3-1, Councilmember Bill De La Pena dissenting with Councilmember <coughs> Gillette absent. All right, that is approved. Move to item 9B, that's direct access electricity generation purchase, and uh, Mark Watkins will uh, handle the staff report on this. And Chuck Rogers, apparently. <laughs> I wanted to make sure you had the A-team here tonight. All right. So uh, thank you, Mayor Fox, members of the City Council, members of the public. Uh, the next item up before you is consideration of purchasing renewable energy from three phases renewables. Let me just give you a quick history of the direct access program, how it came about, where it is today. Beginning with the deregulation of the energy industry in California in 1998, direct access allowed both commercial and residential consumers within the state of California to procure their energy from an energy service provider. So individual residents and others had the opportunity to go out in the open market and procure their energy from whoever they felt like procuring it from. So they could choose to procure their energy from a wind farm, uh, from purely renewables, and from other uh, competitive interests out in the open market. Not long after that was introduced, um, one of the things that the deregulation did is it uncoupled your local utility provider from the generation. and so. What that did was um, somewhat destabilize the energy industry, leading to blackouts and some other issues that we ultimately end up having to deal with. With that, the direct access program was discontinued. <clears throat> Once energy was uh, restabilized in October 2009, the direct access program began again. And there was quite a bit of pent-up demand. And so that allows commercial customers at this point to go back out on the open market to procure their energy needs. Very quickly, the way it works is that Southern California Edison continues to be our electric utility. 
<clears throat> they continue to, I mean, nothing changes as far as the wires coming to any of our buildings. We continue to have the same meters. Edison, we continue to pay Edison for both distribution costs, transmission costs. But that one portion of your bill, where, where it includes the actual energy generation portion of your bill, that is the piece that we're able to disconnect from Edison and go out on the open market. If the city changes its mind in the future, we also have the ability to terminate our contract at any time and go back to Southern California Edison. If we do that, then we pay what's called an indexed rate to Southern California Edison, which means that we would basically be on their open market for about a six-month time period. Uh, those rates could actually be either more or less than we'd currently be paying, depending upon the market at the time. This, this makes sense from the Edison perspective. If you think about it, Edison has to go out and procure energy on our behalf. And so what they're trying to do is reintroduce direct access into the marketplace in a very controlled fashion. The goal right now for the CPUC is to allow 10% of the customers to convert over to direct access in a four-year time frame. Uh, we entered uh, and applied to be able to do this and were chosen uh, through what can be kind of referred to as a lottery process. There's far, few, far more people applying to get into the program than were accepted. Some of the advantages of this is it does add competitiveness to it. In that way, it's very consistent with how we procure all of the other commodities and manage other commodities within the city. Pretty much everything we do, we go out to bid, we go out for an RFP, we go through a competitive process. This makes actually procuring energy very consistent with everything else we do. It also allows us to call for a 100% renewable energy portfolio. So currently Edison's running about 20% re renewable, 80% non-renewable. In this manner, the city can specify what kind of portfolio mix it wants. It also can result in cost savings, and we're still part of the Edison uh, consumer programs, and so we're still eligible for any kind of Edison programs, rebates, and all those types of things that are out there. The disadvantage is it does require us to take a much more active role in managing the procurement of our energy resources. Um, and so you're not just sitting back passively and signing off Edison bills and coding them to different accounts, but we will have to, if City Council approves this tonight, keep track of, of what's going on in the energy industry and then uh, near the end of this agreement, we would be going out and doing another RFP and trying to determine if, if uh, and procuring our energy on a competitive basis again. And there also is a level of risk in regards to tariffs. <clears throat> We're not sure at this point if there's going to be a departing load charge tariff from Edison. Uh, there's some discussion that that might be the case. And that's why within our staff report, we say that our savings could be somewhere between zero and $100,000. We anticipate we're going to be able to save about $100,000 by doing this. If Edison is successful with putting in some of these departing load tariffs, then those savings could be lower, and we can't predict exactly what they would be. Uh, there is some active work going on uh, at the CPUC at this point and others, specifically those, of course, within the direct access program that are trying to prevent that. So with that, the city went out for a request for proposals. There are eight state certified uh, energy service providers out there. We received proposals from four of them, and then we interviewed two of the firms. The firm that we recommend to city council is a firm called Three Phases Renewables. They specialize in renewable energy portfolios, and therefore they came forward with a uh, only one proposal, which was for 100% renewables. We actually had 55 of our accounts. The city has, was it roughly 300, Chuck, overall Edison accounts. 55 of them account for probably 80 or 90 percent of that energy. And then a whole bunch of smaller accounts are for all of our little landscape um, and traffic signals and all the smaller use we have throughout the city. But of those, uh, only 16 of our largest accounts are the ones we're recommending transferring over at this point. And those are the ones that are most cost effective. With some of the smaller accounts, we actually would pay an additional Edison fee to transfer those over. Uh, with three phases, there's also no minimum purchase required. With some of the proposals, they had what they what they call a bandwidth requirement. You had to purchase a minimum amount of energy or the cost that you were paying would change, and that's not the case here. So we would pay a fixed cost for three years, and we can continue with our conservation programs, which was a, a, a very large interest of ours. So if we continue to use less and less energy going forward, that doesn't impact the rate we're paying or the, the per unit cost. With this agreement, 80% of our energy will be coming from uh, wind, uh, and so that wind generation will be in both Iowa and California. 20% of that energy will be renewable energy coming from biogas production in the state of Washington. Within this agreement, three phases does have the ability to continue to manage the portfolio, and so we would always get 100% renewable energy, but the mix of the sources can change. 
Just to kind of reiterate that further point on why no precise guarantee of savings. Two things are happening tonight. We're asking City Council to, to authorize the City Manager to enter into the agreement. The actual price that's fixed will be that price as of tomorrow morning. So if the agreement gets approved by the City Council tonight, then we would lock down a rate tomorrow based on the Edison, the, or not the Edison, the electrical generation rates at that time. Um, that, will get, that will then lock in the generation rates we pay for the next three years. Uh, and then the tariff issue that I mentioned previously with Southern California Edison, at this point we don't have anything from them in writing. What we do have in writing, uh, the, the estimated costs we have do not include any of those tariffs. We're hoping that that's the way it will go. Uh, but the CPUC will potentially hear a rate request for an adjustment. These kind of rate requests are not uncommon, and again, we're hopeful that it's not approved. So somewhat in conclusion, uh, the good things about direct access are the city and overall would be 70% renewable. Our CO2 emissions would be reduced, help us to meet our AB 32 mandates. Uh, there is no minimum, and so we can continue to promote other energy conservation, and we would continue with being a civic leader in our reduction in greenhouse gases. I also want to mention just on the direct access team, uh, this project, as, as many of our energy projects, really started down at Hill Canyon with Chuck Rogers' leadership, with Mark Capron, Vicki Montgomery, and Santos Marquez. As we worked our way through this, uh, Hill Canyon will not be one of, the, one of the accounts that we're converting over. Because of Hill Canyon adding the third generator, we're going to be 100% renewable at Hill Canyon and really don't need this. Uh, but Chuck has continued to carry the ball for the rest of the city, has done the research on this, and uh, negotiated these agreements. And so uh, there is no additional funding requested. All the additional uh, funds are already included within the typical operating budget for our uh, various cost centers. We're hoping for $100,000 annual savings. That annual savings could be less, uh, depending on what Edison does. But we're, we're, if all goes well, we'll be able to both save money and be using 100% renewables, which really is kind of a classic win-win. And so with that, uh, we're recommending that the City Council approve the three-year service agreement with three phases of renewables, uh, approve the expenditure of the funds uh, that are already within the budget to the new service provider, and authorize the City Manager to sign the contract uh, with the approved pricing authority. We're more than happy to answer any questions that the City Council might have. Thank you very much, Mr. Watkins. Very impressive. Questions? Ms. Bilda Lapina? Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Watkins. I was just wondering, in the um, overall accounts that we have, you mentioned 55, it includes the Newberry Park Library. Is that the Newberry Park Library Plus or minus the um, proposed solar panels? At this point, that would include Newberry Park without the solar panels. So, so the, the numbers we have listed here are all based on our, our historic usage. And that's why it was real important to us that we got this, uh, we'll call no bandwidth or no minimum requirement. So we can cont continue to pursue conservation, uh, both at Newberry Park Library, if we, if we pursue uh, energy conservation at, at Civic Arts Plaza, uh, at the main library, anywhere else. We continue to reduce our power usage, but the, the, the unit cost we pay for generation will be locked in. Well, I, I understand that the solar panels are up in the air, but I know that Southern California Edison was opposed to, um, well, was offering a grant, and I don't know whether that uh, plays any role in this at all. If Southern California Edison were to all of a sudden say, okay, we'll give you the money after all, uh, would that change? Would we still, uh, the whole ball game here now, the whole... Uh, yeah, this, this still makes sense. This is a way for okay. us to convert over to renewables, and it's also a way for us to save money. If future technologies come out that allow us to save more money, then we do those, and those would end up kind of superseding what we've got. So this is just a way for us to purchase our the actual energy that we're consuming on the open market and specify both that we're getting 100% renewable power and that we're getting less expensive power. And if we can get even more or less expensive power, then, then we can continue to do that. This doesn't preclude us from doing other things. You mentioned this is a sort of lottery, and not everybody who wants it will get it. Mm. What, uh, that's, that's what are our chances? Well, we're in. Uh, oh, we are. Okay. We, had to, we had to be selected before we could even go through the RFP process. Thank you for clarifying that. I was, right. I was a little thrown off by, by the lottery statement. Okay, thank you very much. All right. Um, I just had a couple of quick questions. You said one of the disadvantages is that you will have to actively um, manage electrical use now. How much manpower do you think is uh, required for that? You know, at, at this point, we've, we've certainly learned a lot over the last few months going through this process, and we'll enter into a three-year agreement with this particular firm. And so uh, it wouldn't take a lot of manpower for the next three years. As we start nearing the end of this term, 
we will then start looking at what the market looks like, determine do we just stick with the same company? Do we go out for uh, requests for proposals again? If for some reason we're dissatisfied with the service we get or anything, then we've got the ability to go back onto Southern California Edison account. Uh, as it is right now, all we do is, is pay Southern California Edison, so it doesn't require a lot of thought. Um, in this case, we will have to just one more step of looking at what we've got. So it's not a tremendous amount of staff effort, but it's not as easy as just writing a single check to Edison every month. And you said uh, the city will be 70 percent renewable then? That's it, it, That has to really be unprecedented. Is, are there any other cities that are even approaching that? Well, Monterey yeah. recently uh, signed. Oh, sorry. Yeah, but their wastewater plants. Uh, um, Monterey recently signed one for their for their city to get to 100 percent renewable, and other people are doing it. Sonoma County um, and this whole lottery thing. It was that exactly. If you can imagine, you know, you probably bought tickets and sat there at your computer pushing the button. There's tremendous pent up demand for an alternative to SEE generated electricity, including renewable energy. So, this was we won the lottery. Oh, that sounds like it. Well, I, again, always um, very exciting to hear the, the work that the city is doing in this area, and, and I think it's really something to be proud of, saving money and saving the environment, basically. So um, do I have a motion? Ms. Bill de Pena? Yes, I move all three recommendations, one, two, and three, to approve a three-year service agreement with three phases renewables as stated in the staff report. Thank and you. congratulations. This is really a big step forward. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Comments to motion? Dr. Glancy? Thank you, Madam, uh, Madam Pro Tem. I want to uh, say that this is another indication and another example of the city's being extremely proactive in uh, the way it conducts business. Uh, I'm absolutely amazed at, at how forward thinking our staff is and its tremendous benefit. So thank you very much for the quality of your work and the effectiveness of it. Thank you. Vote, please. The motion carries 3-0 with Council Member Gillette absent and Mayor Fox absent. All right, very good. Thank you for the report and all the good work you guys all right, did. All right, thank you. Okay, item 10 is uh, redevelopment agency reports, and there are none. Item 11, committee, commission, and board reports, and council member Bill DeLapena will be doing this report on the uh, community water rate structure review committee appointments. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, this uh, was a... Um, the uh, nominees this evening are to form the Water Rate Structure Review Committee, which the council approved last year. I believe it was November um, or perhaps December. And it is to deal with a tiered water stru um, rate structure, which um, is apparently not working out for, for some customers of the, um, of the city who received their water from the city of Thousand Oaks. We have three purveyors in the city and uh, Thousand Oaks um, serves, I believe, 16,000 accounts in the city. And in order to see whether a more equitable structure, rate structure can be formed, we formed the committee. We interviewed Council um, Mayor Andy Fox and I interviewed um, more than two dozen applicants and they were all excellent stellar candidates and uh, unfortunately we could only choose a few not everybody although we wanted to choose everyone and the nominees are in the supplemental packet this evening and let me just uh, read you the names really quickly I have them right here the um, recommendation is to approve appointment of 15 members and the appoints, uh, the uh, nominations are James Dukas, Dean Cacavo, Robert Cashier, Tony Ennis, Rick Freed, Jim Friedel, David Gulbranson, James Phelps, Dave Predmore, Carrot Sarvaya, Barb Stead, Doug Tapking, Dan Towery, Michael Wurzel, and Elizabeth Zernick. And all of them represent a broad range of water customers from commercial to residential, from irrigation to multifamily use, to from low use to high use. 
everybody on this panel is represented and uh, we know it is a very daunting, very challenging task that they have ahead of them. They, they know that as well. They're willing to roll up their sleeves and get to work as soon as possible. And I believe their first meeting is already next week. So I want to thank on behalf also of Mayor Andy Fox uh, for everyone who has applied and wants to serve the community. And uh, good luck with um, trying to make a recommendation to the Thousand Oaks City Council in a couple of months from now. So thank you. Thank you, council member. And uh, we have a motion on the floor. Can I have a vote, please? Motion carries 3-0. Right, thank you very much. Uh, council issues and recommendations, uh, those are follow-up reports on meetings and conferences. There are none. And we are now on item 13, uh, city manager. Follow-up on requests from the public and announcements and upcoming issues. Mr. Mitnick. Uh, Madam Mayor Pro Tem, members of the council, no, no follow-up uh, comments at tonight's meeting, but I do have a, a, a couple announcements. I was asked to comment a little bit on the governor's proposed budget, uh, inform the council and the community uh, what it is and, and potential impacts uh, on the city. And I'd like to stress that this is merely the beginning. This is <clears throat> the governor's uh, initial proposed budget. It will go through substantial review and likely revisions by uh, both houses. But at this point, <clears throat> it's been in the papers, the governor's pr proposed budget for fiscal year 2011-2012 uh, um, will involve really three things. Extensive program cuts um, th throughout the system, throughout the state, uh, revenue enhancements, tax increases, and realignment in functions. Uh, and really what the state is dealing with, and we've talked about this here in these chambers over the last eight years, this is now the vehicle license fee cuts that, <clears throat> that were instituted in 2003, which took the rate from 2% down to 0.6%, and that was money that cities depended upon. It was city and county uh, funds, and the state cut that and said, don't worry, cities and counties, we will continue to backfill and make you whole. Well, at that time, that was $8 billion a year, and then the state made it up through its general fund. So over the last eight years, at least $64 billion, straight math, but if you compound it and so on, the number would be higher, uh, has been lost. But the state, when it cut that revenue source, and it had been there for upwards of 50 years, it did not provide offsetting expenditure reductions in state programs. So it cut our revenue and said, don't worry, we'll, we'll make you whole. And they've been doing that sort of, not really. And now that's coming to roost and it's, it's haunting the state because they can't borrow and play accounting games anymore uh, to, to make up for that. So now they're looking at extremely draconian cuts uh, affecting nearly all, all levels of government. Uh, and the most pro pronounced and profound impact to local government is the proposed elimination of redevelopment agencies and enterprise zones. And what that would mean is that would take lo local property tax dollars away from communities such as Thousand Oaks and give that money back to the state, and then the state then would turn around and spend it on its other obligations. So the taxpayers in local communities stand to lose even more money. Uh, and the pass-through agreements that we have with the school district and the county and the library and the fire district and the park district, et cetera, those would likely be eliminated, would be eliminated, and they would lose that money. So it's a very complex um, situation. We're still trying to digest it, figure it out, determine what the impacts will be. We're working very closely with the League of California Cities, the California Redevelopment Agencies Association, a variety of uh, uh, attorneys, and a lot of the different disciplines, whether it's the Library Association, uh, the American Planners Association, uh, the International City Management Association, uh, et cetera. We're working with all the public works groups, the public safety groups, we're working with them to, to di digest what this will mean. And on the redevelopment side, if the state is successful, it will not, it will not realize the savings that are anticipated and likelihood there'd be um, increased um, cost. But in any event, we're trying to make sense of it and it's trying, the state's trying to undermine Proposition 22, so we're trying to make sense of that. So we don't have specifics for you, Council, to say this is what it means for Thousand Oaks and our local community, but we are uh, doing our best to understand it and work with our new assembly member and our state senator to make sure they understand what the impacts would be. So that's an update on that. Um, 
Also some follow up on the Auto Mall Street Parking Improvement Project uh, for the community's benefit. There are two public outreach meetings scheduled. This information is on the city web and there'll no doubt be newspaper stories, but we also want to take advantage of this moment to advise you that on January 26th and February 10th, there are two community meetings scheduled. These will start at 6 p.m. and they'll be held at the Los Robles Golf Course. So more information will come on that. The next city council meeting will be on January 25th and at this point in time, it looks like we're gonna have two public hearings. One is really a housekeeping matter dealing with uh, the purchasing code with some recommended uh, revisions. The second public hearing will be the proposed development project for the Seventh-day Adventist property uh, over in um, Newberry Park. This is the Lowe's project among other things and this is for the entitlements. This has already gone to the Planning Commission, now it's coming to City Council. And at this time it looks like we will also have two uh, commissions that will involve um, appointments, one being the Planning Commission and the other the Traffic and Transportation Advisory Commission. That is it by City Manager, that, that's it for the City Manager um, follow-up. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Mitnick. Uh, City Attorney Albano is going to um, announce the closed session. Thank you very much, Madam Mayor Pro Tem, council members, members of the public and city staff. Council will be going into closed session. There are four items. One is conference with legal counsel, existing litigation. The case is Schwartz versus City of Thousand Oaks. And we are going to close session pursuant to government code section 54956.9 subsection A. Conference with legal counsel, it's an Anticipated litigation, one potential case, and that is pursuant to government code section 54956.9 subsection B. This has to do with a claim from um, KEC Engineering. The third item is conference with legal counsel, anticipated litigation, initiation of litigation pursuant to government code section 54956.9 subsection C, one case, and that has, involves the city claim against KEC Engineering. And the last item is conference with real property negotiators, property 1858 East Thousand Oaks Boulevard, Thousand Oaks, California. Um, the uh, agency negotiators are Candace Hong, Assistant City Manager, Amy Albano, City Attorney. Negotiating parties for property owner is, the last name of the owner is D-E-G-A-N-I, and Sherry Blessing, which is the listing agent, Lee and Associates. Under negotiation, Price and terms pursuant to government code section 54956.A. Um, if there is anything that needs to be reported out from this session, it will be reflected in the minutes from the session and we will also report it out at the next meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Albano. And uh, that is the end of our meeting. Uh, the mayor had to step out uh, to present a proclamation upstairs. Uh, we have no adjournments tonight. Our annual adjournment for um, uh, Mayor Emeritus uh, Alex Fiore is going to be postponed to our next regular meeting. All right, have a good evening, everybody.